Good morning and welcome to our case of the week for August 3rd, 2021. I am Kelly Twigger, the CEO and founder of eDiscovery Assistance and the principal at ESI Attorneys. And today we are bringing you the case of the week live from beautiful Lexington, Kentucky, uh, where I'm visiting some family this week. But we had a great decision this week uh, that we wanted to be able to get out to you all. This week's decision, of course, is brought to you through our partnership with ACEDS, uh, in which each week we choose a new decision from our eDiscovery Assistant case law database to talk with you about the practical implications for uh, litigators, for you, any of you involved in the e-discovery process, and um, how it'll play out for you and what sort of uh, implications it has for your clients and what they need to be thinking about from a practice and policy perspective. You'll see a link to the decision uh, in the comment section on whatever platform you're viewing us on, whether that's YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. Um, you'll also see a link today to a write-up of this particular decision uh, from Doug Austin at eDiscovery Today. So we've included that link as well, um, as well as a link to our 2020 case law report, uh, which is also available on the eDiscovery Assistant website. Um, I've mentioned it before, but we've launched a new website over at eDiscoveryAssistant.com. Uh, so pop on over there and sign up uh, for our blog at eDiscoveryAssistant.com backslash blog. And you can also um, sign up there to receive the case law newsletter. So if you sign up for the blog, you'll receive the case law newsletter each week. So if you miss our uh, event live, uh, then you can catch it on the flip side on the case law newsletter that comes out each Thursday. So uh, those are good, so good things to get signed up for. Let's dive into this week's case. So this week's case is a decision from the case of Bartis versus Biomet. Uh, this is a case pending in the Eastern District of Missouri. And this decision is from May 24th of 2021 uh, from Judge uh, U.S. District Judge John Ross. Uh, Judge Ross has been on the bench since 2011, and we have 16 decisions authored by Judge Ross on discovery issues uh, in the eDiscovery Assistant database. So he is a knowledgeable judge on these issues. Uh, the law that he cites is spot on, and this is a great case to introduce the concept of uh, data from wearables. So this decision uh, in the Bardis case is on a motion to compel. Um, the issue tags that are uh, labeled in eDiscovery Assistant, as we talked about, are Internet of Things, Proportionality, Failure to Produce, and Wearables. Um, the underlying case here in Bardis uh, stems from injuries uh, that the plaintiff incurred from an allegedly defective artificial hip, hip implant that was made by the defendant. And the plaintiff alleges that he'll continue to experience pain and mobility issues um, and suffer permanent physical issues and injuries um, as a result of the hip implant. The At this point in the case, um, the hip that was problematic has already been removed from the plaintiff and we're talking about um, injuries that he now sustains um, following the removal of the, the allegedly defective hip. In response to an interrogatory, the plaintiff admitted here that he wears a Fitbit that tracks uh, his number of steps, his heart rate and his sleep um, on a daily basis. Following that interrogatory response, the defendant then requested production of the Fitbit data and any other wearable device or other fitness tracker that the plaintiff used. Plaintiff objected, uh, stating that the request was overly broad, unduly burdensome, uh, not properly limited in time and scope, not reasonably calculated to the discovery of admissible evidence, and finally that he was unable to obtain the information. Uh, plaintiff then supplemented his response by stating that the fitness tracker data uh, is potentially unreliable and uh, that he did not begin wearing the Fitbit until eight months after his revision surgery, um, which removed the artificial hip. So the information that will be on the Fitbit is post uh, the hip uh, removal. The defendant now seeks to compel that data, arguing that the data is relevant to causation and damage because the plaintiff's claims of permanent injury are key here, and that if the plaintiff is running or walking miles every day, that that's crucial evidence uh, with regard to his long-term injuries and with regard to the extent of damages that he has actually suffered if, in fact, the hip was defective. Okay, so what's the court's analysis here? We've, it's a pretty simple case, motion to compel Fitbit data. 
Um, the court really looks at um, the discoverability of wearable device data and says two things. One, there's not a lot of case law out there, which there isn't. There are two or three other decisions, um, all of which are any discovery assistant about uh, wearables. There's, there's just kind of a dearth of case law on this particular issue at this point, likely because, as in this case, it is a very factual specific uh, situation where that data is going to be relevant. Um, the second thing the court said is we've got to discuss that discoverability of wearable device data in the context of the facts for a particular case. So here we've got a very specific allegation that uh, the plaintiff is alleging long-term injuries, and we've got data that's been tracking what his physical activity has been. Um, and so the court looks at, at those particular facts. So let's look at some of those facts that the court examines in its analysis. So first, the plaintiff really claims that he suffers these physical injuries due to the implantation of the hip. Um, that he begins wearing the Fitbit approximately eight months after his explantation surgery. But what the court focuses on here is that um, there's some inconsistencies with the plaintiff in his testimony and his interrogatory answers and his uh, objection to providing this data. So, you know, at his deposition, the plaintiff admitted that he can walk over a mile without pain or discomfort. He can move furniture, he can jog, and he can climb stairs. But his long-term damage claims say he can't do things like play basketball or softball. Um, and the, the court says, look, your admission that you can walk or jog without pain and discomfort certainly diminishes the Fitbit data's relevance. But the court notes that the plaintiff really hasn't been that consistent. Sometimes he testifies that he has a lot of difficulty walking due to pain. Other times he says in an interrogatory, other times in his testimony, he says he can do the things we mentioned. Um, the plaintiff's expert designations also reference uh, in their reports that he has difficulty walking. So it's those inconsistencies that cause the court to say, well, there may be some data that's relevant here in the Fitbit. So I think the takeaway from there is you've got to make sure that your client's testimony and your written discovery responses are consistent on what the physical capabilities here if you're going to try and dispute the relevance of this type of data. Um, the court found that the plaintiff's activities after the alleged effective to hip, the alleged effective hip, try saying that 10 times fast, uh, was removed to be relevant and ordered that a portion of the data should be produced and that it was a low burden of production. Um, there's not really any discussion about why it's a low burden of production in terms of getting to the data, and we'll cover that. The court cites the liberal discovery rules, um, minimal burden of production, and limited privacy risks in ordering the production. But he also states that a plaintiff's, and this is a quote, a plaintiff's wearing of an activity tracker like a Fitbit does not warrant a fishing expedition into the data from such device. And that's a key quote here that I think will be, we'll see that cited in other decisions on wearables going forward. Um, here, because the plaintiff's physical activity was relevant to the claims of its longer term physical injury. The data could reveal that the plaintiff is walking or jogging substantial distances. Um, and so as such, the argument that the Fitbit data was unreliable or that was irrelevant was rejected by the court. The court then looked at the reliability of the data from the Fitbit because the plaintiff argued, hey, look, we don't know what it captured, what it didn't capture. We don't know whether the plaintiff was wearing it at one time or somebody else was wearing it. There's a lot of reasons that wearable data can be called into question. Um, and so the reliability is something that comes up. But the court says reliability is not the issue when we're talking about discoverability. Discoverability is relevance and this data is relevant. When we talk about admissibility or reliability, we'll talk about that um, at a later point in the case. So the court did require the production of data but the court also permitted the redaction of any information related to heart rate, sleep records, or physical location as being irrelevant and citing privacy concerns on behalf of the plaintiff. So motion to compel is granted. What are our key takeaways here? First, we got to start thinking about wearable data. If you're not already thinking about it, if you're an organization that's managing phones that are given out to your individual employees um, and they are company phones or you have company information on those phones, you need to know that when we have wearables, that data is being transmitted to the phone and it is collected from the phone. 
So you've got a crossover implication of a potential, you know, bring your own device um, if your company is still engaged there or your policy needs to discuss whether or not uh, individuals can put wearable app tracking uh, materials on their uh, company owned phones. So that's going to be your issue. Once again, with the phones, we're implicating more and more mobile devices. It feels like every week we're talking about a new implication of a mobile device. We talked about uh, WhatsApp and Slack the other day, and now we're talking about wearables. Um, we're seeing more and more information that's coming from mobile devices. And so instructing your employees, having a policy and plan in place as to company information on phones or using phones for company related information, even if it's a personal phone, is going to implicate that device for purposes of discovery. And you've got to be aware of that. Um, if you have a case, if you are working in the employment context where you see a lot of disability, if you're working in the personal injury context, any kind of case where you're going to have a personal injury and that uh, the physical fitness or the physical attributes of your client or of a party are going to be at issue, it's very likely that wearable data is going to be something you need to be focused on. So you need to think about preservation. You need to make sure that your client is preserving that information. You need to think about collection, how that information is going to be provided. And you need to think about scope. What is the scope of the information that's being uh, preserved and collected? And what of that is actually relevant to the case? Because you need to be able to protect your client's privacy. Um, there's no discussion at this point, but I can see insurance implications uh, going forward for wearable device data being produced in discovery. So lots of considerations there. You've got to make sure you're taking the steps necessary to protect your client's privacy and that you're only providing whatever information is relevant to the particular dispute. Uh, I think there's also going to be some kinds of issues about the format in which data is provided, whether it's able to be provided in a native format that's going to allow the other side to be able to create uh, visuals and information um, about that data or whether it already exists in such in the app. So um, format's going to be another issue that we're going to see with wearable data. All right, that's our case of the week for this week, short and sweet. Thanks for joining me. I'll be back next week with another edition of our case of the week from eDiscovery Assistant. If you are an ACEDS member and interested in using eDiscovery Assistant, there is a discount available for current ACEDS members and a trial for folks who are studying for the exam. If you're interested in either of those, please drop us a line at ACEDS at eDiscoveryAssistant.com and our team will reach out. If you're interested in doing a free trial of our case law and resource database, you can jump to ediscoveryassistant.com or and sign up to get started in the upper right hand corner, or you can drop us a line at support at ediscoveryassistant.com and we'll get you going. Thanks so much. Have a great week. Stay safe and healthy and put those masks on.